I'm not gonna, sometimes I pause and then everybody say, you know, talk to your neighbor, but we've just been doing that for half an hour and it was a little, like, it took a while to get everybody back. So I won't do that. Um, but I did want to do a quick poll. Uh, how many of you here, we do the poll every time, so this should be some data science project or something, <laughs> small data. Um, how many of you are here on the academic side of the university or academics? So we have that side. How many are in IT? So imagine that camera can count. All right. And then how many are here um, visiting who aren't, you know, part of the university proper but are uh, local, uh, came from the VIA? So yeah, cool. So we have, um, great. But many of you have not actually ever been to the Skydeck before. So I want to give Gordon uh, who is our representative from the Skydeck and kind of program manager here, a little bit of time to talk about Berkeley's accelerator and incubator and what you all do. Right. Thank you, Bill. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Gordon Kang. So what is Skydeck? We, uh, we are the university startup accelerator. So we bring in about uh, 20 core teams to accelerate throughout the process, with, throughout, the, throughout a six month process with investment from a public private partnership fund um, to allow this public institution to um, to bring Berkeley's IP talent and network into a monetization strategy, and uh, we we have a, so we have those twenty teams and about a, another hundred or so uh, hot test teams as well. So those are secondary accelerated companies that also um, come through our process, uh, come come through our organization and. Um, are able to take advantage of, of what we have to offer, ranging from uh, meetings with advisors like Bill here and uh, some of the uh, boot camp style classes that we have to de-risk their startup to uh, fireside chats and general events hosted here. Um, does anybody have any questions? Is the only IT project that has sponsored? Oh, uh, so for the startups, we are actually industry agnostic. So we have startups that are biopharma, um, hardware, software. Uh, we, we run the gamut, essentially. Yeah. Well, if you guys know of any world-changing startups um, <laughs> that have the potential to contribute back to Berkeley very, very well, um, please come talk to us. <laughs> Great, so thank you, Gordon. Uh, I'm going to just, without further ado, Owen, I will turn it over to you and then eat some pizza. All right, thank you. Hi, I'm Owen McGrath from Educational Technology Services on campus. And Bill put it pretty well. I'm going to talk about a story, um, our use, our dabbling in virtual computing. And it did involve the big cloud, as you'll see in a minute, Amazon, but we actually settled in on the local private cloud. And that happens to be Aeon, which so. Um, you know, I refer to Jason as kind of the architect rock star of AI. So I'm the warm up band, and later you'll. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry. So, instructional computing is actually one of the oldest IT services on campus. It goes way back, lots of history there. But you can imagine where. Um, computing in classes has been a big deal and a sort of ongoing service for years. And facilities for that you know, sort of had their heyday um, probably 20 years ago. And there are just a few of them left. They're very specialized nowadays. They tend to, if you're going to still run an in person physical facility, it's for some reason like uh, we have one geared towards uh, the music department where they do digital music and um, they teach people how to do. Um, synthetic music composition in this beautiful facility that has all kinds of neat music related stuff. We have another one that's now um, here towards 3D design, maker, AR, VR design, that sort of thing. And then um, one towards math, science. But um, one of our biggest facilities was in Pullman Hall. It was actually kind of three labs in one. Um, and it um, had a particular attraction to um, graduate programs in public health, um, psychology, and the School of Education, which was housed there. And so 
um, around 2016, um, those, those tenants of, of Tolman Hall knew that their new building, which is now completed Berkeley Way West, wasn't going to have any computer lab at all. And so that's sort of a motivation there to start saying, what are we going to do? For some, for some classes, it wasn't a big deal. But there was a core set of faculty who were very concerned about this. And so we were in dialogue with them. We've been tracking virtual computing solutions forever. And you know, there's sort of a sine wave to that, um, how that, how that works. Some of them are promising. But we, we, we now have reason to go back and look um, at the marketplace. And it turned out that, um, as I'll tell you in a minute, there were some good products to look at. But the, the short version of the story is that they were very motivated. And so that's, that's a great position to be in when you're trying to do service transition. We weren't going to them saying, we need to move you. They knew that, um, and this is Holman Hall today, but <laughs> somewhere down in there. They knew that this was coming, and so they wanted to work with us. So that's one story I want to talk about. But another one comes from uh, some work that I do with my colleague, Anne Marie. Um, this is actually a campus-wide initiative funded by the students it's, um, through the Student Technology Fund across many years. And so this is where the students um, clearly understood the many IT gaps that they faced, um, craters really, like there was no student help desk for computing, that kind of stuff. And so they funded us to look at those and address those kinds of issues across the past several years. Um, wide ranging focus from the help desk, which was an early success. It's in the Moffitt Undergraduate Library. Um, we had a technical component to this where we're looking at uh, uh, computing needs in general and what, how to match them up, not just with the day-to-day -day computing, but the 21st century curriculum, data science, that for instance. And then outreach. Um, you know, anyone who's familiar with Berkeley just knows that sort of the, the tragedy of this place is there are all these resources and you don't find out about them until <laughs> graduating semester or something. Um, and I want to credit Bill for this because early on in this uh, student getting a nap at Cal initiative, Bill kind of gave us some ideas about how to think about it. We, we were wrestling, I think it's fair to say, early on. Um, we had a very traditional approach to desktop imaging. Could we just get everyone like the library and ETS working on that? And Bill kind of broke that apart for us. And this is just one you know, new way of thinking about it, but it's the strategizer role um, from uh, the value proposition design. And I like that because I think that really characterizes what we've done. We've been very iterative, um, very ethnographic. Um, we, we go out and observe and talk to students constantly, and it allows us to pivot a lot. We pivot all the time in this project, but we've, I think we're spending their money well, and we are delivering outcomes. And that took, one of those actually turns out to be a gap that emerged really early on is um, even if you get them the right computing, the right printing, um, and all the knowledge they need, there's still these really intriguing software gaps where they'll get into a course and there's some very exotic, expensive piece of software they need for that semester, or maybe even just for a few weeks. And surprisingly, those, there are some gaps there that we're also looking at. So that's the other story. Um, yeah, and so we look across a whole range of things, but virtual environments keeps coming up. So our first part of this, our, our real first pilot was with those classes that were gonna lose Tolman Hall. And this was already in the fall of 2017. What was nice is we still had the existing facility. So there was a safety factor for them. Um, but they wanted to try out some virtual environments. We had um, approached Amazon. They had kind of a new round of their online services, a new version of workspaces, which looked pretty good. And best of all, they, they agreed to subsidize our pilot um, that semester. And if you ever look at Amazon and Workspaces or AppStream, you'll find out that Cornell is their showcase campus. Um, and so we, we had heard a lot about that. I'd seen some presentations by them at conferences. Um, and they definitely jumped out ahead. I, I would say that uh, they also started with Workspaces, but then moved to AppStream, which I'm not going to talk about so much today. But the story is, kind of resonates. Um, they were seeing, now this is a very well resourced school, by the way, they don't have necessarily the same, and then they have a lot of, it's a residential co college, so they probably have labs, but they were still finding, especially in engineering courses, there was this disparity around um, high-end engineering simulation software. Part of it was just making sure everyone had access to it, platform issues, but also a, a need to democratize, to make sure that no one had an edge over anyone else. 
And so they partnered uh, with Amazon early on and um, did some amazing stuff there. For our pilot, though, we weren't necessarily looking at engineering college scale, hundreds or thousands of students. Again, we were focusing on some of these graduate level courses. And, and uh, as an example, in the School of Education, these are core courses. I'd say they're um, above intro and then higher level courses um, for graduate students. And so these are students who are kind of neat. These are required courses in some cases. This, this is kind of the basic tool set of statistical analysis and inferencing they'll need in, in their graduate study. For some of them, these are going to be um, the tools they'll be used later on in projects. And so, particularly working with Sophia, you know, this is Berkeley, right? So she didn't write just the book, she wrote several of the books. She's um, a real international leader in this field, um, which kind of raised the stakes for us that this pilot better succeed because um, there was no bluffing for. Um, and so we had that fall to use Amazon Workspaces. Uh, it was all subsidized, as I mentioned. Quick takeaways was um, were it worked incredibly well. And, and again, we were dialing it up. We had they, they had this sort of always on model where a student goes into a browser, and it's literally like having a laptop in the sky. And it would start up just almost as quickly as a real life laptop. Their environment there is their their personal desktop is there. Is there their files, it, the state is safe, so it's, it's just as if you woke up your laptop. Um, very impressive. We, we didn't have time to integrate it with campus systems, but at this small scale, that didn't matter so much. Um, you know, it became clear to us that this would meet that, that range of needs around the statistical software. Um, clearly, you know, there are some things we wouldn't want to do on there, like the AR, VR stuff, and the heavy design things that might um, require some sort of output. But um, yeah, it was, it was very successful. And then at the end, we started to say, by the way, what, what would that have cost us? And um, I heard this. I, I don't want, I want to be neutral on this, but I think anybody who has Amazon experience knows that um, at least you know, when I looked at this a year ago, the billing is inscrutable. Um, and so we never did get a good answer on that. Um, and I'll just leave it at that. At the same time, though, um, it just so happened that my organization and our research IT had been joined together. I had heard about this thing called Aon. It sounded really cool. I'd met Jason. Um, but just around the time that um, we merged together, Jason had produced a cool paper. Um, we got to looking at it more closely and suddenly realized, wow, this, this has a lot of features we're looking for. And I think the first pilot helped us understand better what we would ask. And sure enough, Jason was game to trying this out. And so, um, kind of in a beautiful experimental fashion, we had the same courses um, coming back in the spring, different students, but the same instructors, same, very motivated, clock was ticking. And we said, hey, try this other thing, too. And so we uh, worked with Jason. And now this meant, you know, this is very different. This is not a subscription model where you're just turning it on. Now we're doing a little bit more work. Um, had to understand AI, the community support model behind it. Um, we even had to start talking about, you know, renting some hardware in the data center. But uh, at the same time, there was this amazing community that we could tap into, and I think he's going to talk about that later. Um, this had integration, which is really key for us. So now we weren't having to sort of create weird little accounts. The students were able to use their Talnet. Um, moving data around is a big deal, for especially when you're in the graduate level and higher. Uh, the data sets get bigger, the data itself is actually your focus. You might carry some data across courses and into a project at the master's or doctor, doctoral level. So it was really cool to be able to tap you know, Google Drive, which they were familiar with, and, and have that uh, sort of show up on their desktop, and that was a way for them to move their data in and out of the environment. Um, again, it's just like having a laptop in the sky. Um, really amazing performance once you're logged in. And some of the lessons learned. Again, it worked. It actually worked better, according to students. I don't have any sort of scientific metrics, but they, they, the instructors and the TAs had come across both <coughs> semesters, and they said it was actually better performance, which is fascinating. Um, having that integration was key for us. Um, cost, you know, I, I don't have a, a cost comparison, but I will say from somebody who runs a, an organization. 
it's sure is nice to have some control and predictability to your costs, um, which I didn't feel like I had at all with Amazon. And by that I mean, um, if you know the people who you're bringing into the budget year who can support this, you know what it costs to rent some blades at the data center. And um, you can predict what would happen if a whole bunch of people suddenly got interested in this. How would you scale that up? Um, at the same time, we still continue to track the commercial services, but here in 2019, we're going into our third year of using AI. Um, there, there are new players all the time. There's a company called Aporto, specifically going after this academic computing market. Um, so we're, we have some colleagues at BC Irvine who are um, moving in a big way towards the portal, and we're kind of trying to see how they figure all that out. But I have to say that it would, it would take a lot to win us away, because the other thing about AOD, which Jason will talk about, is this is coming from the research computing realm. Um, this is a tool set and an environment that researchers were already using. And it's fascinating to see the different applications. Um, there are folks in environmental design who have ArcGIS in there, and they do their thing. The business school is doing amazing things for their, which I'm sure he'll talk about. And so, particularly for our, our customers in this, if you think about graduate students, as they move on in their career, we love the idea that this could be the environment that they're taking into their dissertation project and beyond, and that is something that even the faculty find interesting. Yeah, and just back to that um, strategizer role and student computing account, I think we're turning back to look at the needs. Um, we have some big proposals in about addressing some of the uh, computing needs for students at Berkeley, and certainly looking at how to uh, provide that just-in-time access to um, certain applications right when the students need it. Because we're literally, you know, there, I could go on, we, we have food scarcity Berkeley, we have computing scarcity. You know, we have second year students taking computer science courses and they don't own a computer. Right, so to suddenly, for a student to suddenly find out they need to pay $100 to get ArcGIS for two weeks, you know, they, do, they skip it, they don't, they don't get the software. So we want to look at those things and study and look carefully what students are doing. I do have to run, but I can answer some questions, but I'm sure Jason can probably answer all any of my questions about later too, he knows where he's case. I don't think more to add. <laughs> 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 any questions? Yeah, so how many, who and how many people do you have doing this ethnography? Like talking to students, following them, understanding what they needed? Yeah. You and what army? <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's a rare yeah, a couple generals, but we do have some staff funded through Student Computing Cal, and I think we've um, sort of spread around that methodology. Of, we do sur surveys, of course, but what's beautiful is we've been doing these pilots every semester, and we tend to tap students we have direct access to. We both both Emory and I have large student workforces, and okay. so you know there's nothing like being able to get direct access to somebody while they're on shift and start talking to them about them. Tell me why you do that. You know, um, yeah, that's the best part. Maybe, you anything you want to say about that? Maybe just that we also built some partnerships with different groups on campus so that we could hear um, from very targeted groups. So we were meeting with the EOP office and learning more about students that were in the Educational Opportunity Program. We met with the Transfer um, Student Parent Program so we could hear what's different for transfer students that are only here for two years. And, um, a couple different approaches like that. We just kind of sent our students out there to build partnerships and student government. Actually, they ended up being really big allies this year. There were a couple of student senators and various positions who cared about student computing and cared about this kind of technology equity issue. And um, they did a lot of our work for us, which yeah. was terrific. Um, worked they with us on some surveys. Willing and, to include our questions on yeah. the surveys and that sort of thing. So it's very kind of crowdsourced. <laughs> so about how many workstations did you spin up, say, last semester? We're in the summer now, so you probably don't have anything going on. Um, it's around 100. It's still the core courses. Public health comes in and out of this as well, um, because they also have that same loss of the physical site. Um, we've actually not advertised this so much yet. and. Um, um, I need to make sure we have the staffing resources behind it that some of the transitions around our services factoring here too, but we haven't gone big on it. So. Yeah. 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 Ye
So a hundred workstations, how does that look from a user point of view? Like are there how many students is it serving? It's in, one to one. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, it's serving sorry, hundreds of students. Right. And when you said that the AWS billing was inscrutable, did you get anything that looked like a dollar amount? Kevin Chan worked at that and I I he tried for a month to kind of come up with that cost and uh, we even raised this with no, very frankly, they were open to this. It was not the first time they heard about their billing issues. Um, uh, so we never, we never did actually get it down to a per hour or per student kind of cost. So that's why, obviously, I'm kind of so it was like lumped that. together for a bunch of workstations. Yeah. So there's like a monthly part and then a utilization part, or you really just don't know. They were not able to provide much on the utilization, so it was more lumps, lump sums. Um, so which Amazon probably watches these. Uh, YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Yes. Oh, and what is the cost model for um, yeah. path? Yeah. Design. Yeah. Well, see, that's a good thing because a lot of costs are sunk for hidden, right? I mean, Jason's already. I did not pay for Jason. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> and so that's a good point, and and that. That's a scale issue too. So I think um, we're catching a time when our leadership is trying to see you know, what, what services make sense and they're willing to float, float these for a while and say, should this be a common good service? But the AI, AI, right now, the AI community has a model that does require not just hardware contributions, but um, sort of brain share and expertise, which is really fascinating as well. And so I'm sure we'll talk about that. problems that we had like when this project. So um, it's basically about using using computer vision for a larger scale uh, digital pathology analysis problem that it's in Alzheimer's disease. So what are we trying to do? Uh, we want to map a protein called tau and how it's spread in the brain. So basically we have real human brains and we, we have this computer vision pipeline that's going to find this protein, create maps, and uh, quantify these maps and create 3D visualizations. And basically, how we work, I'm going to skip through this presentation because it's kind of long. Uh, we get these brains, we have patients that volunteer to this project, we get the brains. We actually have their MRI and PET scans in vivo, and then when they pass, we get these brains, and it goes through some chemical processing. And when they're ready, they go through some a cutting, uh, slicing, sectioning, and they're finally um, mounted in glass slides. And they're actually huge slides, like usually five by six inches. They're way bigger than normal microscopy slides. And what we actually have to do, uh, we had to do is uh, building our imaging platform. So we had our uh, in um, in-house made scanner whole slide like scanner and the, the uh, software, uh, controller software. And usually when you scan one of those slides, uh, you're going to end up, depending on the field of view, something around like 10 to 20 gigabytes of raw data. And one single brain can have around 800 slices. So it's more or less 20 petabytes of raw data per brain if I'm to process all the slides. And those images, like and when they go through stitching, they are big. They you're gonna end up with another like 10 gigabytes image. That's gonna be about 850, uh, 8,000 8, by 50,000 pixels. That's why I need all the computer vision stuff to process those. And real quick, that's how the images look like. And if you can see here, uh, 
you see like these tiny black dots, those are the tau inclusions. And those are the things that you're trying to segment out of this image. So um, currently, uh, we are running most of our pipelines on Winto. Winto is a USSF cluster, cluster USSF. But we have, but Winto doesn't have GPUs right now. Um, they like, they have public access to GPUs. And one of the well, problems is like we have a lot of things that have also to do on the workstations. So I'm gonna talk about it. Um, that's the image processing pipeline. I have a mo um, module where I have like, the imaging and the my stitching that runs on the cluster. I have a low resolution version of the image and I have a very high resolution which is gonna be about 10 gigabytes. Uh, I do some pre-processing, like automated background segmentation and to do registration. So one thing that you want to do is get the slice and bring them back to the 3D space that they, where they used to belong, because I want to be able to compare those, this, this histology data to MRI or PET scan and other near image modalities. So we have something called block face. Um, that's this image here. That's the kind of, this, that's a photography of like the brain block using slicing. We have a camera on top of the block, so just keep taking pictures. Uh, they are, they're going to be pre-processed in real life, so we can actually have a 3D volume of the brain. And this works as a template, because when you do all this staining and cutting and staining and mounting, you're going to have a lot of artifacts, you're going to have a lot of information. So this is a 3D template of like, kind of like the original um, brain shape. And that's an incubated space for, uh, that we use for like pair images. Uh, once, once you do a uh, low resolution processing with uh, K to do registration, we begin with the high resolution image. And here, okay, yeah, that's where like the core of the pipeline is. We are trying to find this again, this protein here. And we use deep learning, so which is kind of like uh, standard right now. And for Ready to deep learning um, network, we need the GPUs, right? And that's what we don't have on the right now. Um, this is our training uh, labeling procedure. We have to do some mega labels. So, and we use, we use a semi automated um, tool from Fiji, Fiji's image J, where you can actually have segmentation that is pre trained, like you have the user selecting some uh, samples. And you pre-train and um, it's actually an SVM, and you create like some masks that you can later correct and have your labels that are going to be used for training these networks. And that's the kind of a uh, um, yeah, that's the kind of result that you get from segmentation later. So our network is based on the UMAT architecture, and I don't know if you guys can see here that's like the original and that's. If you see like the green lines here, that's the result of the segmentation. Um, yeah, it's finding the top of the thing. And from these masks, we can actually compute what we call heat maps. So this heat maps is like, it's the, um, there is spatial maps of the mean thanks to your power that we have inside each uh, one micrometer of tissue. And that's the kind of map that you see here. And like here, like the brighter the color, the, the more color, the more things you have, things to color you have in the tissue. And once you get these heat maps ready, you want to um, align them to the, your MRI or PET scan. So, um, so you do a 3D registration between your MRI and the block face, which is this image here. And you have your uh, heat maps aligned to this block face, so you can just overlay them, and you can do a, a direct comparison between MRI signal and heat map. Uh, and this is the kind of result that you get from this, heat map, this kind of processing. And here's like um, this is like the original histology, and that's the heat map. You can kind of see uh, it's really um, making sense because you have like higher density here, and you have like brighter colors. And you're doing this um, for two whole brains. And that's the kind of result that you get. 
you can relate, later relate the result on MRI or PET scan, and then you can begin doing correlations. Uh, problem is, from this pipeline, uh, you have a lot of manual um, steps, but those steps are actually not that time consuming. 90% no, of our like, project time has been on grading uh, some core like parts of this pipeline, when is this teaching, where I have to stitch all those 20 gigabytes of uh, raw image into one single big image. Uh, the other one is tiling, because I have these huge images and they, uh, they can blow up in their memory, basically. So I do like some tiling, break them in smaller, Im in smaller images and it makes it easy for you to work. Uh, the actual segmentation, and that's the one of the bottlenecks, because uh, we don't have the GPUs right now on Wacom, so I download everything that's ready from the pipeline back to my workstation. And that's one of our like big bottlenecks, and they run the segmentations, I have a, a workstation with two GPUs, and I send them back to the cluster. And then I finish my pipeline and run the other uh, modules that actually <laughs> compute the pipelines and create like pseudo color presentations. And then I can download it back. <laughs> And visualize, visualizes and finish the workstation, run the uh, registration and do the visualizations and run the visualization software that are running on the workstations. Um, so yeah, so 90% of our time has been, uh, we have been spending this time like that basically. Running, sending these files to the cluster, stitching, getting files back, um, doing something, sending them back to the cluster, running half of the pipeline, bringing them back, doing the segmentation, sending them back to the cluster. And I think like that's, we could improve that, definitely. And one of like, the problems that, or one of the things that we actually consider was like, maybe using AWS or something. Uh, we didn't go that way basically because of cost. So, and one of the things like, uh, we told the cluster is like, um, it's available for everybody at this set. So, we don't have, as a lab, we don't have any extra costs, so that's why we went through Wintham. Uh, with Wintham, let's some numbers here. For one single slice, um, I'm gonna have about around 20 gigabytes of raw, which is like 100, uh, 1500 files. Um, and then when I do this stitching, I'm gonna have an extra file of like 20 gigabytes. I have like 200 file, files that I keep because if I want to rerun the pipeline, I have to rerun everything again. So I'm going to have a, around a, uh, more two gigabytes, uh, two gigabytes, uh, twelve gigabytes for image tiles, twelve gigabytes for masks, and twelve gigabytes for mask tiles. Because I'm just working on gray, um, gray matter, so I'm getting rid of like all background, the white matter. Um, when I do segmentation, those segmentation of tiles, I my pipeline is wide enough to detect what's background, and we just don't work with those. So it's you have a little less. Uh, gonna have a little a smaller number of tiles, which is gonna be about three gigabytes, but the final map, which is like same resolution of the original image, image is gonna be about three gigabytes. So it's about a hundred gigabytes per slice. I currently not we are currently not working like our slices in the brain. We usually leave gaps because you're gonna you want to have like different stain in each slice stain or something else. Uh, we currently have precise twenty uh, five hundred twenty four slices, which is about uh, 52, 52 terabytes of data. Uh, we end up purchasing our storage, uh, so which is, uh, has like 100 terabytes of storage because we are running out of space all the time. We had our like, public um, directory in Waco and we were just like running out of space and had to download everything to the workstations and free up some space and bring the data you needed back and work and uh, then you know, when you have to copy it and send all the data back and it was, uh, it was like very complicated, so we ended up like just buying them storage. And you have the time stamps. You have like the time, but I don't know, the time it takes for saving these files, even though you're working. Uh, it's our internal network, but it's super, sometimes it take like, it would like spend one day just transferring files. It couldn't really work because you were transferring. And, um, Okay, we do have a lot of issues with crypt files, and sometimes um, the network fluctuates. Something happens, and you're like, transfers just 
you lose your connection in transfer slot. Uh, one big problem there, like uh, C, is um, data man management in general. For, in uh, for instance, um, versioning of data sets. Something, sometimes we use scan something and you do the other processing and you're like, well, it has to be rescanned. So I need, yeah. So I have to rescan and I, I'm like, what is the older data set? What, which one is the new? Which one is the older one? Right now, everything's kept in a Samba folder, a shared folder. So we don't have any real, like, really good tool for data management. We also don't have like, a really good tool for data transfer. Like, I think like in Dell, they all use globals. And uh, when I saw that, I was like, I wish we had that, something like that, similar like that. I'm just using my parsing right now. Um, and we need like a social attached GPU, basically, if you feel like it's going to make sense. Yeah, and if you guys have any questions. Hey, how long uh, does the computational aspect take when you said maybe a data transfer files for weeks? Days. Make for what single lives? It's not actually not uh, that long. So I would say it'd be like two to three days. Thing. So it's it, everything's like in very parallel. So just yeah. run everything like like you just like put like a hundred two hundred jobs on the on somebody run. The the bottlenecks really come from like fire transfer. Do you have ways of prioritizing jobs? Sorry? Uh, do you have ways of prioritizing jobs? Like I, I worked at a oh, yeah, I no, worked at a um, place before where if, if someone had a paper due, they kinda got like the I don't think we, no, I don't think we have these um, mechanisms right now. What uh, what do they have is like uh, they have like paying paying users. Mm -hmm. It's like somebody who like uh, contributed with some hardware. For the cluster, so they have some higher priority, or they have like a high, a bigger number of like slots. We are not paying yes. it right now, so we are like kind of send credit. Do you have access to something called globals? No. So that's something that is signed the LBL because uh, it has some collaborators that we don't have it. What do you do? Uh, they they have some licensing uh, many access points. issues like there. I asked IT at this assessment, they, did, they had some licensing issues with Globals, I didn't know you had to license it, but... I will give you a second try. <laughs> so, Berkeley has Globus, but it sounds like UCSF doesn't, or maybe it's UCSF many different doesn't. realities For across some, Berkeley and UCSF. Yeah, UCSF doesn't. At least, uh, yeah, my department doesn't. Like, one more question. You are transferring the file just to do the segmentation on the workstation? Yeah. So there is no way of doing segmentation on the cluster? Well, only if I use the CPUs instead of the GPUs, but that's going to be so slow that I'm, I, I'm, I might as well just transfer the files. Where is this cluster? Where I mean, There, I know like, there, like they have some initiatives of having GPUs. Uh, the thing that I, for having a GPU on the cluster right now is like we have to buy our own server and GPUs and send them and give it to them. And it's kind of like out of our budget, so so we're just using the ones we have a local, locally. So this web, Globus comes with a lot of features, and uh, the features that you want for data transfers are all free for everybody in the world. You don't need to have a license for just transferring files from one location to another location using Globus. Mm -hmm. About data transfer, Globus provides other features like sharing capabilities and. Uh, data repository capabilities. For those, you need to have a license. Um, so everybody in the world just get on, can just open a Globus.org, create an account, and they have instructions on how to bring your laptop into Globus, or your cluster into Globus. Once you do that, then transfer it software. But uh, I, I saw this like on the once, there's like no workshop there. You, your institution has to be there. You have like to have some relation with Globus, right? So if you want those additional licensed features, like okay. sharing capabilities, repository capabilities, then yes, you, your institution need to have it. But just for basically transferring capabilities, you don't need any institutional support or license. Anybody can just log on to global.org, create an account, or start transferring data. Okay. Yeah. 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 Y
I want to check that. Yeah, yeah. Is this something that like a user can do, or do we need support do it. from IT? You don't need support from IT. It's all uh, designed for users to do on their own. <laughs> Krishna, when you log in, it, it'll let you log in through your federated search, but you don't. If UCSF isn't one of those listed, she could still create a personal account. Personal account, yes. Yeah. So don't be thrown off if UCSF doesn't show up in a list of yeah. login mm -hmm. organizations, because you can just create an account. With your at gmail.com or yahoo.com email that you might have, or you are at, at ucsf.edu, that particular email address has the login, you can create an account on global.org and start using their free services. Okay, I want to check that now. Okay. I, I think you mentioned you had processed two brains. How many brains would you like to process if you if your pipeline was faster? Uh, we like to have at least six because it's uh, it's the six stages of Alzheimer's, according to like in ecology. It's called BRAC, BRAC staging. So zero, for instance, is our control is not a control. It's actually a BRAC one was from somebody that had the symptoms that already, already had Alzheimer's. And zero is a completely normal person. One is, I think like they begin like getting the symptoms around two over, two over rat three. And there's a problem with Alzheimer's because it's silent. So when you get this, the symptoms, it's like your brain is already really damaged. So we like to see how it goes across all the spectrum. Rats. Yeah. You mentioned that you tile the data to make them more manageable and stuff like that. Is there any side effect from tiling, like maybe the edge? Maybe the protein, the tile protein was like the way to tile, like a ch chop off? Do you see any artifact of that approach? Really? Yeah, no, it might have issues. Why? Uh, not so much with tiling. Uh, I have issues like when you run this, the neural network uh -huh. and at the edges. So what I do is I do padding. I just like replicate. Mirror the image and the segmentation, and it just cut this image back to what it was. Oh. So, do you collaborate with any faculty on UC Berkeley for this work? Uh, I just, for this work, no. I, we, we have a, a collaboration like uh, Danish, which is in my friend Albia. Uh, like UC Berkeley faculty can get free computing allowances on uh, the campus Savio cluster. Um, so yeah, if you're collaborating with any UC Berkeley faculty, they can get a computer allow allowance set up on the institutional cluster, and you can we have GPUs on the cluster, so they can be used for this is, this is the kind of work we want to support with Savio cluster. So that, that's interesting. Yeah. Did you say you're collaborating with someone in LBL? Yeah. Well, yeah, LBL has yeah, a LBL has a Laurentium cluster, which is institutional cluster. But they they still don't have GPUs. They have, they have. Yeah, a lot of we have like 24 volt V100s uh, <laughs> these days. Ah. They have a lot of GPUs. Are they are those uh, on Cori or? No. Uh, so. Because I have an account, yeah. Um, <coughs> Why don't we you still have an account on that? Yeah, for the... <laughs> we can take it offline, but. <laughs> There are a lot of resources which you can you use. Can 20 GPUs, right? We could use them. <laughs> 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 there you go, 20 GPUs, I can use them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for my card. Yeah. Thank you. Well, there's no follow up to that kind of incredible presentation. <laughs> but, um, and we'll give it a shot. So um, Owen talked about um, his investigation into uh, the need for virtual machines, mostly looking on the um, on the instruction side. And so what I'm going to talk a little bit about is um, a uh, computational service for researchers. At least that was the original ambition. It has grown into serving researchers and instruction. Um, I'll give you a little bit of a background on, on, on research computing at, at Berkeley and kind of where this, um, where our sort of services for research computing came from. Um, really with the intent to kind of um, provoke ideas for and to kind of illustrate where we're, where we're headed with it. So um, uh, around five years ago, a number of faculty got together on campus and 
as the story is told to me, um, uh, went forward to the Vice Chancellor of Research and said, um, we're not, uh, we, we need uh, support for computation intensive uh, work on campus. Um, some of our colleagues, faculty colleagues, get that support from Lawrence Berkeley Lab, but others um, don't have that kind of support. We're working in social sciences, digital humanities, and so forth, and so we're actually losing grant funding because we can't demonstrate that we have institutional support for computing. Um, curiously, um, I had been at Berkeley for, for 10 years before that in public policy and had worked on some grant funding research and, and decided to leave in part because um, uh, it didn't seem like there was a lot of support in the central IT group for research computing, which I had, I had moved more into. So um, ironically, right after I left um, this faculty, submitted the letter, the Vice Chancellor of Research uh, and uh, the CIO, um, Larry Conrad, and uh, the Chancellor agreed to put funding into to create uh, research IT and, and Berkeley Research Computing. And so immediately, um, one of the first steps was to um, reach out to Lawrence Berkeley Lab and partners there uh, to establish high performance computing service. Um, but because of the nature, uh, I think, part of the original request, it was always clear that um, we're going to need to provide some kind of computational platforms for folks who will not be working in traditional research computing or high performance computing. And that it was also going to be really important to um, provide a program of consultation and research facilitation to reach out to different groups on campus and help them, help researchers. Um, figure out what's the right fit for their compute needs. Um, the right fit, you know, what's the right compute resources and storage and networking needed. And so, um, sort of thus, Berkeley Research Computing was born um, with our sort of HPC condo cluster um, uh, being established, um, cloud computing, cloud consult consulting around cloud. We knew we needed to provide something in the cloud arena at the time, but we weren't really sure exactly what that should be. And ultimately, we decided not to try to run any sort of um, private local cloud uh, for research only um, uh, computation locally, but instead we would try to develop an expertise in being able to advise about the cloud so that researchers could at least ask the right questions before they, before they, before they jumped in. Um, so that's kind of become merged with our consulting practice, which we regard as sort of the center of what we do. Um, and then the final uh, part and the best part is the analytics environments uh, on demand. And so that was always envisioned, and, and, and the purpose for my hire was to develop a computational service for folks who are not in those sciences, who need some other kind of compute modality um, library likely with which they are familiar because you you it's a really hard thing to to tell someone forget forget what you're doing now with your technology and and we're going to move you over here and i'll tell a funny story about that in a minute and so um we had to get that going and it was sort of the last service um to the group and so we had to do it kind of fast and so um i i, I was charged with figuring out what that was and to get it like available as soon as possible and so um, analytics on environments on demand is this idea of what we would do. So when I took a look around, there are tons of resources available for doing um, working with Linux and in different capacities. No resources available on campus for doing anything computational with Windows. And the reality is that a lot of digital humanists and social scientists work with Windows. And so um, as their fields have become more computationally intense, they have wanted to ramp up um, their Windows experience. And so what happens is um, you start running a data analytics job on your, on your laptop, and I don't know what's happening, but it's taking three days to finish, and is there a better way? And so um, thus analytics environments, environments on demand was born. And so um, um, here's what it is. So I keep this kind of slide um, up to date, analytics environments on a nutshell. It's a virtual Windows-based research desktop in support of computationally intensive research. And that's one definition of it. Another definition, IT service supported by campus partners 
a consulting practice and a working group. And so, um, and it's also, uh, the third way to think of it, it's an allocation program where it provides compute resources to a department or a project in exchange for um, time from a technical partner in that place, uh, some of that person's time. Because it was really clear that even if we could provide a service uh, for these folks, um, we don't have the staffing and scalability to support um, a thousand users or two thousand users across campus given the staffing we have. So I had to come up with a service model that would um, sort of create staffing out of what we did have. And so um, thus I sort of came up with this idea of an allocation program where I would give a department uh, no cost allocation of compute resources. In exchange, they give me two or th two to four hours of an IT person's time. And that person in the department supports their users locally. Wow. Um, and um, and uh, that's um, really the only, you know, as well, what did you have to go through to think of that? It was really the only thing I could think of. Having worked for 10 years, at the School of Public Policy and kind of having the experience that when you are the IT group there, no matter what the question is, um, you are the person they go to. Like anything that electricity runs through is yours. <laughs> so, so email was mine. I even think this is how it was mine. Google, no, it was my email. It's a, and so I figured, well, I have to get these people um, who are supporting the, the faculty and research there, they have to get them engaged. You know, as it turned out, um, it was a really easy sell because you could kind of go to them and say, look, um, in exchange, you know, I'm gonna give you these resources and you know, you're gonna have to support these virtual machines and you're gonna have to take away time from supporting your Windows desktops to learn how to, you know, spin up virtual machines and um, add storage and think about it. And of course, yeah, I want to do that. That'll be really fun to do. Um, so they really engaged with it. And so um, uh, that's the only way that the, that the service has worked because the service model involves uh, bringing in staff from, from, from uh, all the different, from different departments. So the design principles of it, um, it had to be turnkey. It had to be really uh, direct and easy to use and fit the model of computing that, that people were familiar with. Um, it had to be uh, scalable and interactive. You know, so you can do visualization in HPC if you have a visualization node, um, but um, it's um, primarily a kind of command line experience. And so AOD had to be sort of very interactive, like, okay, my state of job failed, I wanna tweak this, and I'm gonna run it again. Like, had to be very quick like that. Um, easily shared among colleagues and, and, and then reliable and secure. So one of, the, one of the things about the easily shared is that um, in terms of accounts, I use the CalNet system for, for, for accounts. Um, the HPC side um, uses their, their own accounts and so they have to deal with account management. I don't have to deal with account management because I'm using CalNet so it's kind of great. It's like, it makes it awesome and easy to, do, to, um, to provide. Um, what are they use it for? For what? So, um, for research, you know, run research on computing on your virtual machine with more power than your laptop. Um, so for each, um, each department that's a partner, we give them 136 gigs of RAM. If they're good partners in the, in the department, I can give them twice that much for a limited time. So if somebody needs to run, like, on 250, you know, Windows box on 256 gigs of RAM, you know, I can, we can do that. We can do that temporarily, and that's, that can be super fun. We have a number of partners on campus, uh, currently Haas, uh, Goldman School of Public Policy, Archaeological Research Facility, um, ETS, which is now Research Teaching and Learning. Um, that's where Owen is, so they were a partner and then we sort of got merged with them. And then uh, most recently uh, with, the, uh, with the law school. Um, so um, we've been running for um, two and a half years. We're kind of adding a partner like one every semester. Um, and we, um, as I explained, you, um, you join the service. We get technical support from people in the field. They agree to be on an AOD working group 
We meet every two weeks. We discuss operational things. We provide, internally, we provide a very lean Windows-based image that then I can give out to the different departments and say, if you can build your, your virtual machines on this base image, um, and it's a, it's a secure base image. We started out, we were in like 54 gigs, now we got it down to 19 gigs. Um, so we're pretty excited about that. Um, here's an example of, of why, this is, um, why this is great, and this is like very heartwarming to me. Um, Sergey uh, Shevchenko is my AOD partner at the Goldman School. This is the kind of interaction he's having with researchers trying to, trying to get them the right fit. They, would have been, they had started using AOD and they're running into problems, it's slow, and then he digs into the problem, why is it running slow on this virtual machine and not really sure. And then, and then these are the kind of responses, okay, when you're not gonna get a speed up on another platform because of what you're trying to do, um, the really fun story that I promised to tell was that there's a school on campus, the researcher's laptop was uh, not working out, they bought her a $12,000 machine, they put Stata on it with the, the most expensive Stata version, the A processor version, maybe that's not the most expensive, but that's what they put on. So they probably spent like 16000 they wrapped it all up in a package, they gave it to the professor, she started running her, her compute job and it ran slower than her laptop. And that is a ballistic moment. That is, that is, and, and it's because they didn't, they didn't know at the time that um, if you do regression analysis and say that yes, it will use all the cores if you get the eight, but if you're doing data filtering or other analyses, it will only and ever use one core. And so that's what she was doing. She had 24 cores, but every one of those cores is slower than one of the cores on her laptop and so it ran slower. So this is a similar kind of, and this is what he's explaining, but like, I can't buy that. That's, that's gold right there. I don't have uh, 1.25 staff. I, there's no way we could do that across campus. And so th that is, that, that's, what, that's why it works, because you get that kind of expertise. Um, for, for Berkeley grads, which I'm not, Sergey is a, is a graduate of the uh, CS department at, at Berkeley, and he's a he's, he's treasurer at the Goldman School. Um, but all our partners are. Um, so, um, in the interest of time, you know, where where is uh, where is AOD headed? And one of the places that it's headed is like it's getting it's getting it's, it's taken up in the tsunami uh, wave of secure computing, right? Um, as the social scientists come on board and do research computing, then, then, then they're not working with um, images of the night sky, they're working with, with, um, with data about people. And then that has to, that's very sensitive, and it typically isn't as high a volume, but the sensitivity of it is great. And so um, what we're doing is um, we're taking our AOD infrastructure, which, which is built, by the way, on, on infrastructure that uh, one of Bill's teams manages the VMware Citrix infrastructure built for enterprise computing. We're taking that and we're, we've reconfigured it and make it uh, sort of hardened, cyber, more cyber secure environment so that researchers working with data protection level one data can, can, um, can be able to, to, to uh, compute using AOD. Um, I like to think, and I'll kind of, kind of, kind of wrap it up here, um, what AOD does, among other things, is it, it allows departments on campus to start thinking about cloud. You know, start thinking about, well, instead of buying a certain, I mean, this will sound like antiquated to a lot of people in this room, but still, start thinking about, maybe I won't buy a bare metal thing and put it in the data center. Maybe I think about, well, what if I needed it only for six months of the year, or only for two months, and then what if I use those resources and kind of for different folks at different times. And maybe I have like, sometimes the needs are for like a regular 16 gigabit, uh, gigabyte machine. Maybe other times I want like three giant machines instead of eight smaller machines. And sort of thinking that way. Um, and then that gets you in the kind of right mindset to start thinking about um, well, what, are, what are the clouds offer? And what's available at AWS and, and, and Google and Azure? Um, AOD's moving towards the, the 
um, secure place. We're also thinking about um, perhaps we're doing a sort of service development project now to consider um, what would be like if we move some of our service to AWS and it was hosted there. Um, we built this and set this up like two and a half years ago. Things, things are changing. There's pros and cons for doing it locally. Um, it's all in the Warren Data Center. Um, Azure, for example, Microsoft with Azure has come out with data science virtual machines, both in Windows and in Linux. They didn't have that two and a half years ago. So we're doing an analysis now to look at what those data science virtual machines are. Again, they're in Windows, so that, that, that's, that's really compelling, um, potentially, for us. Um, so it's, uh, it's established, but it's a fun, it's a fun uh, work in progress along the way. Um, you know, I love hearing, uh, I work in research computing, so it's incredible to hear stories and kind of what you're working on. Um, um, from what you describe, it may, you know, I think uh, maybe kind of, Bill and I were thinking like, how could AI help you? I think maybe you're probably better served in working on some of the resources up at, at Lawrence Berkeley Lab. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a really fun conversation. I can tell you like in different groups that I um, have conversations with, everyone is asking the question, when and what do I move to the cloud for, for enterprise and administrative computing and for research computing? How do I have a mobility in between? How do I not get locked into a particular vendor? Um, how, does it, how do I stay neutral with it? Some people are, and then people say, well, it's so much more expensive in the cloud versus building locally. I can tell you that last week I was, with a, uh, I was on a panel with a um, um, uh, professor at UC Davis who works with um, secure data for, um, in the water, um, water for California. And he said something really interesting, which is sort of not service provider mentality. So, so, so service provider mentality is, well, I have to keep the cost down, and I have to be able to scale, so I have to, again, keep the cost down. And so he, he, he said, some of the first question was, well, why is the cloud more expensive with the data ingress and egress and, and storage is going to be more expensive? And, and we're all like, yes, it's more expensive, um, the person was saying, but in some cases it can work out better. Maybe you don't have a data center at your institution. Maybe you would be, have to build a new one. Um, and there are other reasons you could consider. I chimed in and said, like, if perhaps you need to do a very secure environment and um, you want to sort of test the waters first, you could consider contracting with someone like Sherlock at UC San Diego, who has a secure environment that has already got an authority to operate and is blessed with HIPAA or, you know, and higher levels of security, then cloud becomes an option, but it is still some cost. And the professor said very interestingly, no, I disagree with all that. I do everything in the cloud. Yes, it costs me 20 something thousand a year. Keep in mind that it's less than 5% of my grant budget. I don't care that it's, maybe you can tell me it's twice as expensive, I don't care. It's less, it is a fraction of my research budget and it works. So, you know, end of story, right? Like, and so, so, so on the service provider side, oh, we don't have much money, what, what can we do? We have to constantly, but we also need to keep in mind that for a lot of and researchers, and it, actually, I've heard this from another researcher on campus too, where it's, you know, where we said, like, he said, why aren't you using Sherlock? Why are you building your own at Sherlock? Well, but Sherlock's many, you know, can be many times more expensive depending on the complexity of your architecture and the storage you need at AWS, I said, well, I, 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 but I have grant funding. And is it like, so, so, and he's coming with, I, I want to get this done. I don't want to go around, you know, I don't want any impediments. You're telling me this is already ready, but you're telling me it costs twice as much, but it's still fractional for my grant? I want it done there immediately. No. So we're trying to, 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 to you know, um, absorb and, 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 and think in those ways too about um, doing computing. And, then, and that's what makes the most important part, and I'll end on this, whether it's analytics environments on demand or HPC or cloud computing, the most important part of research computing from, from my group across campus is knowing what's out there and being able to convey that to researchers and make sure that they ask the, the, some of the right questions before they before they before they jump into 
an environment. That right fit, that consulting, um, is essential. And and uh, Krishna, who was here earlier, and uh, Tin, and others from LBL, and others in the room, and Rick, and Indro, and, and we all work on helping researchers figure out what's what's their right fit now and into the future as their computation changes. So um, that's what I got. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Questions or You have it all figured out. <laughs> <laughs> you, you mentioned those groups. Are there any doing, and I think you, you mentioned at one point, administrative, the process type stuff, as opposed to computation. Is there groups that are coming on and, and bringing their administrative tasks and systems into your environment? Or are they still using the standard virtual servers and data center? Yeah, so. Um, AOD is built on that system that, you know, somebody in the data center says, I want a Windows file server. Right. So that's built on that. Um, so that, that is happening. I don't really see into that world too much anymore. What is happening is more and more people are saying, we're getting rid of this physical lab. And what could we do here? Mm -hmm. What could we do with like a virtual lab? And then, you know, of course, what's happening is a commodity uh, entities are, are coming around too. So this company called Aporto, which is very active at UC Irvine and, uh, and NYU, and it's, 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 they use all the cloud providers and they provide Windows machines. It's, it's, it's AOT as a commodity, right? And so if that keeps coming on and st stabilizes, then um, like many other IT things, starts out as an innovation and then it becomes like, wait, why are we doing this locally? Because it can be done 10 times cheaper somewhere else in some other events. But research is not administrative computing, right? It's messy and it breaks and it has to always be like the next thing. And so maybe it will last a little longer. Yeah. So is the AI initiative originally funded through research grant money that was allocated to kind of spin up <coughs> these very like yeah. unique but high computing. Yeah, so that's a great question because I I get to say like AOT is a fraction <laughs> of the cost of what we spend on high performance computing. Like not even a tenth. Huh. Um, so I spend like less than fifty thousand a year to provide <coughs> No cost compute resources to partners across campus. Okay. They get that no cost, and then they can say like, "Well, this is great." Like Haas and ETS have said, "This is great, but I need more." And I say, "Okay, that's great. You can get more. I will facilitate that. You can buy in to the, and you can add more compute resources to your allocation." Um, and so then the the researchers or the group are are paying for that, and that's an IST. Central central IT cost. It's like a, just a pass through from that. So there is a way to kind of institution, you know, can can scale up. That's what Haas does. Um, they they bought in big time, um, and but they use it for their Masters of Financial Engineering program, and then when that ends, they cut it off for a while. So yeah, great. Yeah. Questions? Do you want to talk a bit about, <clears throat> for people who don't know, uh, how the condo model works in the HPC and what's the equivalent look like as you think about cloud computing models? Uh, sure. Remote sure. Um, so uh, the condo model in HPC is. Um, a really interesting and fun way, and Tim, please jump in um, uh, as I as I move through this. The condo model is a sort of way to scale your existing compute cluster um, in a way that serves everybody who uses it sort of at the same time. 
So, so, so if I have, for example, suppose I have um, 10 compute nodes in my cluster. Uh, or, uh, and, and I've bought all those. I'm the service provider. I'm buying 10. And I'm saying, community, um, here we have this cluster, and, and you are welcome to use it. Um, we only have 10, though. And if you would like to buy um, and add to this condo, you, may, you can buy your own hardware with your grant funding, which will not be taxed because it's capital equipment. So you can buy that, and we will add it to this existing cluster, and you will get, um, you will get priority but not exclusive access to those additional nodes those that you bought. And so, um, Suddenly, the, the, if, you know, say you are then able to double the number, now you're up to, say, uh, if you get other people, you're up to 20 nodes. And now you have more users. And users can submit a job, a compute job, and when um, the nodes become available for them, they can use all 20. And thus, a compute cluster grows as people, um, you know, decide, I, wanna, I actually want to buy, buy in because I want preferential access to some of the compute. They might say, for example, um, I want to add some GPUs to this cluster. So you can buy GPU nodes and add it to them. But then, when those GPU nodes are, are, are not, essentially, it's more complicated, but when they're not being used by this project, they're available to everybody on campus. And so you get this kind of great, as it grows, everybody gains from that. It's really fun, um, really fun system um, to, 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 to grow. On the AI side, it works a little bit different, but, but not too much. People can, they can't, um, right now anyway, buy hardware to, to, to add to AI, but they can sort of rent it. So they can rent it from IST and pay a monthly cost, and thus they can expand um, their, uh, their resources. It's kind of like a condo. But when they do that, they, they have exclusive access to, the, to what they have added. Um, so these models work really well. There's variations of it. Um, Stanford has a condo model for their HPC. But when a researcher buys, say, four nodes, then no one else can use those nodes. Only the researchers who bought those nodes can use it. Um, they do that. And there's actually there's competing reasons and why that can be a good idea. And we've struggled a little bit with this at Berkeley, where we'll add some, a researcher group will buy, say, some real high-end GPUs. And then as we were kind of working out how that would work, you know, at one point, um, this is when we got an email, hey, I'm trying to use my new GPUs, and I haven't been able to get on them for two days because other people are doing jobs that are, that are, that are using them, and hey, you know, what's going on? I just bought this. And so we've had to change the policies of usage so that for um, groups that there are very few numbers of the special sort of um, nodes that people who bought them can, can more, more efficiently and directly use them. So you get into those kind of things, so you're tweaking policies and trying to, trying to, um, trying to make it, um, um, available to people by it, but then also shared. Um, so there's there's fun things, and Tim's group at LBL um, is is engaged on that, and, and he knows much more about it than I. Yeah, Jen. Oh, I was just going to say, sorry, I was going to the the positive thing about the condo. Why? What's the app? What's the the um, benefit to the researcher who's contributing, they actually get support and system support and power. I mean, you know, so in other words, part of the, the carrot to the condo model is not only that you're doing the greater service to the greater good because you're sharing your resources, but you're actually getting a lot of service and support gratis because you're willing to, you know, sort of, you know, provide, you know, the greater good resources. I almost think of ours as like, a timeshare, like going to the like you 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 you've got a rental mode, a condo mode, and I'm like our condo mode is kind of like a timeshare almost, yeah. where you get priority because you bought into the timeshare, but then other people can like you know Airbnb it or rent it when it's not being used. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, I was so just sorry. Jason, sorry, I just had that aha. Oh, it's a great. Yeah, that's a great. Like, 
it's kind of like a timeshare. Yeah. So send Jason yeah. if you want a free one, and then you just have to listen to a pitch. <laughs> 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 All right, well, uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. So the next UC Berkeley Cloud Computing Meetup is July 30th. We will not be in a horrendous conference room. We'll be upstairs.